Everybody, I'm very honored to welcome into the studio today, Mr. Alvin Wong Graylin, who is one of the top influencers from China and really a true expert on the metaverse, virtual reality. Alvin, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us here on Real Talk China. <laughs> Thanks, Cyrus. Appreciate your invitation. I look forward to our chat. Absolutely. Alvin, I want you to um, you know, introduce yourself because you have uh, accomplished a lot in China. You're, you're very experienced. Uh, I know that your role right now, you are the president of HTC China. Um, tell us a little bit more about your role and you know, some of the accolades that you've been able to uh, you know, win and accomplish so far in your career. Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I've actually been in all of the, the VR, XR industry since about 30, 31 years ago. So I, I studied actually uh, VR as part of my uh, undergrad. Uh, back in 91 and uh you know i have actually left the industry for a while and then i've been back to it about uh, seven eight years ago mm -hmm. uh when i joined uh, to hcc and uh, started to run their china business uh and i've essentially built from the ground up the the, the both the business and the ecosystem in china you know, i've actually been uh, voted the, the most influential person in the xr industry in china for the last five years and uh, hcc has been voted the uh top company in XR for the last uh, four or five years as well. So um, yeah, so so we, we, we've actually done a lot to to build the industry here. And I, I, I feel like I've got some inside knowledge of what's going on. Uh, I've all, I'm also part of our investment team, which have invested in over 120 companies uh, in the XR space. Um, and I'm also the uh, vice chair of the industry of VR Alliance with about 300 companies. And it's the only uh, Chinese government sanctioned and 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 um, uh, recognized industry association for the XR industry. That's fantastic. What well, some great accolades there. And I know you you know been doing this for over thirty years, so you've got the real insights. And I'm I'm really excited because I, I know a lot of people are interested in the metaverse. It's a term we hear you know quite often now. And I, my first question is for those that don't understand metaverse, you know, let's say they have zero knowledge of this. Uh, what's the easiest definition for, for this future technology that will become a big part of our world? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the easiest way to think about it is it's really not a brand new thing. It's, an, it's a continuation of a trend that started several decades ago with the Internet. And okay. this is just the evolution of the Internet going from a, a 2D and 1D type content of, you know, tax and links and, and video to now 3D environments of uh, spatial worlds, right? So that's really the, the, the key shift. And then in the past, we've essentially consumed the content using 2D devices, screens, phones, you know, computers, laptops. We'll still continue to use those devices for the next few years, but longer term, we will start to transition to XR devices that look and feel like glasses uh, that you know you'll be wearing all day. So, and it's a much more immersive experience because it surrounds you. Okay, that's a very good, very good definition. I mean, it, it's it's so it's basically more of an extension of the internet. It's just the internet's it's growing and it's getting. This is the next phase of what of what the internet exactly. Is. And and I think this next phase is going to last a long time because we went from kind of the initial you know links and and you know hyperlinks and little flashing gifs, you know, to to having. Uh, you know, uh, pictures and then to having video uh, and now to having live stream. So right. we keep getting the content gets more and more sophisticated, more and more interactive. You know, we're going to be essentially every every website in the world will essentially become a independent little virtual world that you can go into. Uh, just like when you go into a store, uh, you have people in there, you have activities, you have, you know, things that you can pick up. It'll be the same when you go into these future uh, you know, web worlds or, 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 or future websites. So Alan, my, my next question is, uh, you know, here in the West, we, when we hear the metaverse, we are immediately think of Mark Zuckerberg. We think of Facebook, which of course has now been, you know, actually changed the name to meta, uh, you know, and really, you know, showing that, you know, Zuckerberg and the future of that company is definitely going to be investing heavily in the metaverse. Um, what is the main difference between say China's metaverse and then the version that Mark Zuckerberg and, and Meta are creating. I don't know if it's a matter of China versus versus Zuckerberg, because I think Zuckerberg uh, is trying to create, you know, even though he says he's trying to create an open metaverse, he's really creating something that is controlled, managed uh, by Meta, right? Okay. A single company, right? Uh, which, which uh, you know, we really don't feel like is the, the long term solution. You know, just like today, you know, you have a few major social networks that control 
and and influences a very large portion of people. Right. Um, what we would like to see is to see a, a much more web-like environment where somebody can go in and they can go to any site they want. They don't have to have a special password or a special account to get into there. You can essentially have the freedom to, to take information that you have from one place to another so that uh, the individual has more control over their, their data, their privacy. That's a little bit different than uh, what uh, the, the, the type of world that currently is being painted by Meta because they, they even require you to use their own devices. Right. So you okay. can't even use anything other than a, a you know, meta quest to enter gotcha. their, their worlds. Uh, you know, we, we feel like, like I said in the beginning, I think the majority of people for the first few years of this metaverse kind of development will actually use non XR devices to go in there. So right. I think that that's going to um, uh, require you to allow for, for openness of, of device, openness of software, uh, you know, and, and openness of, of accounts which uh, are all kind of counter to what is being proposed by, by Meta. Okay, that's a good explanation. So essentially, Meta is more of a closed environment, much, much like you know, a social network. You, know, you need a username, a password, you have to register on that site. Whereas you're, you're saying now the, the, the long-term goal is if we just keep that more, if you think of it more like the internet, obviously the internet, anybody can access, it's, it's, it's worldwide, it's open yeah. to everybody. You don't really need a username to get on the internet. Uh, you just need a, a connection. So it's more of that open, open source. It, 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 exactly. And I, I think that's, that's where it should go. And that's when you provide the biggest value to society is when you have an open network, because, you know, a, as we all know, the, 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 the rule is, uh, you know, the Metcalf's law, right? The power of a network is the square of the nose of the network, mm -hmm. which means the more people are on it, the more accessible you are, the more destinations you have, uh, the more valuable this entire network is to to the population. You know, if you look at the beginning of the internet, you know, remember a CompuServe and Prodigy and American Online, right. they were all supposedly internet, right? Right. But but they were a closed system. You have one ID, you can chat with a few people that are on that service, but you can't go across. You right. can't share share accounts, and you know, you had all those little CDs that were being sent everywhere, right? Uh, I, I think I think you know, if you look at now, all of those companies have disappeared, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, we have what you know, the more open internet that we have today. I think we're going through kind of a similar phase. Makes sense. It makes sense. much much like AOL back in the day, America Online. I mean, that exactly. was the first. That was my first internet experience, and yep. uh, I mean, they certainly were successful for a long time. But then, I like you said, I think the evolution um, in how this metamorphosis is going to happen. We have some slides we'll show later on kind of the, the metamorphosis of this of this metaverse you know probably will link to a more open environment is that something that china really wants is more of an open metaverse experience one that well, could go uh, beyond borders yeah i i think that is definitely something long term they want i mean short term they're trying to figure things out right just yeah. like every everywhere else but but i feel like the one thing that china is doing um that's a little bit different than most governments is actually they're taking a holistic view on on this issue mm -hmm. and having you know, both national as well as regional and, and provincial city level programs to try to figure out what, what is the answer? You know, what, what is the right way to manage it? What is the right way to for the user experience to be? You know, what what is what are the policies that are going to create the, the best outcome? And right now, at least I haven't seen any other countries uh, that have national level type um, initiatives uh, yeah. or, or, or programs. You know, I, I'm not sure. Uh, when when those will happen, but I, I think you know this is something that that needs to be experimented to figure out what right. what's, what will be the right answers because it is something that completely would change the way people will interact with each other and with uh, with you know other uh, with the services and sites and apps because uh, it, it takes us from a more consuming type environment to becoming more of an inhabiting or, or, or coexisting immersive environment. And, and that from a mental perspective uh, and from a, a user interface perspective changes really uh, everything. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's really good. I'm going to bring up one of your uh, slides here. I thought this was quite interesting. Um, you know, you talked about, we talked about this four phases of the metaverse uh, metamorphosis. And, um, I, you know, you and I were talking before the show, I, you know, you said we're still in the egg phase, which is really this, you know, first one to three years. So we've got a Got a long way to go, you know, before we get to that to that butterfly phase. You can chat on this uh, this yeah. interesting graph. I mean, I I, I think that's the one thing I, I you know I just came back from Shanghai uh, yesterday, and there was the the World um, Artificial Intelligence Conference, and I spoke about this particular topic. And the the idea is that you know if you look at uh, what happens with the butterflies, they go through these phases where from 
from essentially eggs to the, the, the larva to the, the chrysalis and then to the adult butterfly. And at each, at each stage, it, it looks completely different than the prior stage. Right. Um, but at each stage, uh, it gets more and more sophisticated, more and more capable uh, and, and, you know, uh, more and more mobile. So, so I, I think, I think that's something that uh, the, the metaverse will also go through. Um, I think they're trying to kind of take the same approach where, you know, every one of the, there's now 20 plus cities and provinces that have issued essentially initiatives to, to, to uh, recruit metaverse companies, to, to, to facilitate and sponsor different programs, to, to figure out new policy, to create better data centers for this stuff. So all of this stuff is happening in different, different provinces, mm. trying to figure out, you know, their, their best solutions. And, you know, from there, from these experiments, I think they'll be able to figure out what are some of the things that actually will work. And then they will then uh, expand it to a, a, a larger uh, area. But I, I think the, the thing with um, the metaverse, a lot of people think it's already here because you see a lot of news, a lot of hype. They're like, oh, the right. metaverse, you know, we're the so-and-so metaverse and they're the so-and-so metaverse. Right. Um, most of that is just hype. Right. I mean, okay. as I mentioned, as you saw in the chart, for us yeah. to get to that 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 open interoperable world uh, of of many many open worlds, it's going to take you know creating a lot of standards. It's going to create take uh, a lot of technology advancements. It's going to take um, cooperation between countries and between companies, and and it's all going also going to change take the the changing of user behavior and and, and acceptance of taking a device that's you know on the desk or in their pocket to something that's on their head, right? Right. All of that will take a lot of time. Yeah. But I feel like China China probably has the best chance in the in to be the first you know essentially large market to have a a holistic metaverse experience right now that mm. metaverse experience may not expand beyond its borders but i think the longer term that chrysalis will crack and 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 a a, a more open metaverse will come out of it uh, and and i think because the, the reason why i think it was it's going to happen first is some of the the issues that are keeping the metaverse from from becoming reality is actually less technical and more policy and more behavioral and legal driven Right. Okay. Things like having a uh, a common ID system. How do you get you know a hundred different companies to agree to which ID system to use? Uh, the good right. thing about China is they have the the, the the real ID that's tied to your phone number and, and your and your you know social ID. And right. so you know it's, it's already part of every social network in China. So there, 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 there's no need for for creating a, a secondary ID. You also have an amazing network that's already there with you know five G. There's more five G towers in China than the rest of the world combined. Right. right. And, you know, there, I think there's already you know, several hundred million 5G uh, users in China. So all of these things, there's already gigabit fiber to to most major cities everywhere. So so the, 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 the infrastructure to to enable it is already there. I think one of the, the other thing is, you know, both the, the population and the, the, the country seems to be very open to adopting new technology that creates value for its citizen. Right. Absolutely. So yeah. uh, from, from that perspective, uh, you know, you look at what happened with, you know, the, the, the mobile internet, with, you know, text messaging, with mobile payments, you know, with EV adoption. All of these technologies have blossomed first in China because policies allowed it to happen and encouraged mm -hmm. it to happen. And the people, you know, kind of, I guess, adopted it very quickly because they saw that the value it created for people. And I think we're yeah. going to see similar types of things happen with, with, um, with the metaverse. Uh, these are great, you know, adjectives or, you know, great benefits, I should say, from, you know, this environment. And I, and I agree with you. I mean, obviously, you and I have lived in China a long time. Uh, you know, we've seen this amazing transformation, for example, just as we know, something very simple, just the uh, non uh, cash, for example, and how how quick that was to transition. I mean, I remember being in China when everything was cash. And yes. now it's come. I mean, it's been cashless for many years already. And everything's really run through your phone. And, you know, the Chinese have really very much embraced that. And I, I agree with your I agree with your statement that I think China is a great testing ground. I think that the citizens are very open to adapting new technologies, like you said, with the EV market as well. Obviously, that has flourished very much in China. And uh, it's exciting. I think it's a great playground. And of course, I, I know the government's behind that. So once that happens, then, you know, they're, like you said, there's hundreds of companies popping up, you know, provinces all over the country, uh, you know, really encouraging this development. And when you have it at the 
I think what, what I also picked up is he said China is really the only country in the world that has said, okay, from the local level to the provincial level to the national level, you know, on all these different levels, we're going to be uh, developing this. And so when you have so many different areas, uh, you know, all contributing, of course, you're going to make a lot of advances in that technology. Yeah. And, and I think one of the key differences is also the ability for the government to influence the, the behavior of the companies. You know, if, if China decides, okay, now we're going to, to, to you know, use this kind of privacy policy or we're going to use this type of, of ID system, pretty much within weeks or at most months, all of the major players in the market will have uh, executed, will have right. you know, put that change in. And I think that's something that's very difficult for, for any other country to, to actually execute. Uh, and, and without consistency of standards and consistency of execution between different major players, it's very difficult to, to get that interoperability that is necessary to realize the metaverse that we all talk about. Absolutely. Well, I think that that is definitely one of China's advantages, having, uh, you know, the central government being able to control policies. And, and like, I mean, we've seen that over the last 18 months, really, you know, this very big changes in the tech industry uh, with some of the biggest companies, you know, in China really having to adapt and change their models. And and I think even, for example, in some of the social media networks, um, the algorithm, right, there's been a rule that has come out right. there where essentially the users are given the, the freedom, they, they have the power, you know, do you want to adhere to this algorithm or not? Do you want to opt in or, or do you yeah, not want I, to? I, I think that that's also an example of something that uh, China is a little bit ahead of the game. In fact, I haven't heard of any other markets where the uh, the country has put in regulation to do AI algorithm, uh, essentially empower the user to have control over the AI algorithm. Whereas today, right. most people on social networks are a slave to these algorithms where they're just being yeah. fed. The motivation of, of the companies who are doing these social networks is to have you stay as long as possible, to click as many things as possible. 100%. And so the algorithms want to just keep you kind of numb and just watching. Absolutely. That's that's a huge difference between, um, you know, China's network and, and and what we're seeing here in the West. And I mean, I've watched some of the, you know, there's been some really interesting films on Netflix, you know, interviewing a lot of these um, former employees of uh, Facebook or Pinterest and Instagram. And, you know, they actually had all, you know, left the companies for ethical reasons. You know, it's like, I can't work there anymore because of, we know what this algorithm is for. And and like you said, it's a, it's uh, for those companies, it makes sense. I mean, they, they, they're they profit driven and they want to, you know, keep you on engaged in that platform as long as possible. That is quite a powerful thing, I think, when China gives that power to the individual user and you can just yeah, opt out of yeah. that and, and have a, have a clean feed that's that is not based on what the what the algorithm knows you want to see that's a very yeah, very yeah, different I, experience that we won't be seeing in the west i don't think yeah I, I agree in fact i think this will be even more important uh in in the metaverse era than than today because yeah. of the ability for that technology to to influence you and the ability for that technology to to reach you with all your senses right before right. it's pretty much just your eyes and your ears now you know when you're immersed you actually create uh, memories that feel like you were at this place. You know, right. you, 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 you may get, uh, you know, other types of biosensors that are sensing, you know, are you nervous? Are you confused? And then the, the content might change to adapt to you, right? So all these kinds of things will allow it to be an even more effective communication model. Right. And so if the AI can, can, can st start tweaking all of these things, it, it can actually really change and influence mindsets. So I think, you know, the government giving people back some power to control that is, is actually quite powerful. In fact, I think one of the things that if you look at, you know, China also uh, recently uh, released their, their privacy and their, and their data security laws, mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of it looks quite a bit like the GDPR from, from, the, from Europe. So they're, they're not afraid to, to find and, and kind of learn from best known methods from other regions. Right. Uh, in terms of, of, of figuring out how to protect the privacy of the users. And, and, and the privacy uh, will also be even more important uh, in, this, in this world because you start getting, let's say, eye tracking information. So you know what people are looking at, so you know what people are interested in. You start getting right. you know, brain uh, computer interface, you might get EEG signals that would tell people their interest level or their mood or whatever. You also have cameras that are looking out, so you might get you know, views of people's homes. Where does that data go? How is that being used? You know, all of these things um, you know, requires a certain level of protection so that it's not being misused. That's that's important. That's a really important thing. As as obviously we have these new technology that's going to be more uh, immersive and and certainly more realistic. I mean, you know, the trust factor has to be there, right? and so that that's a huge factor that needs to happen for people to you know for this to develop and and really to get more users you know buying into this new concept. One one of the things you said, Alvin, that was really interesting was uh, the potential. You know, you said countries need to work together. 
countries need yeah. to work together on this and, you know, potentially. So I want to know, you know, is it is it possible for the metaverse to develop into this borderless technology that we're going to see, you know, every country in the world all using this in, in one area? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it, it, it definitely will will happen. Uh, it yeah. may take you know longer in some areas than others. I think adoption of this technology will will create so much value for the companies or for the countries that adopt it and for the citizens that adopt it, that that value will be a natural force that will push people to to use it. And then, right. you know, the, 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 the network forces of it uh, having a larger network will then create more reasons for people to combine. If you if you look at you know the internet, you have things like you know DNS and and TCP/IP and uh, SMTP and all these these sta standards uh, that have been there to to create essentially a, a a common network across all the nations. Right? You can right. have any any phone or any computer just have a connection and a browser. You can go anywhere else in the world, and these and the right. servers and data can be anywhere. The, the world has proven that it can do this when when the value is is there to do do it, gotcha. um, and and you know I, I think there's definitely so much value that will be created from a, a 3D interoperable immersive world that um, those the market forces will will drive people to work together, uh, and the companies who want to stand in the way will become more and more either ostracized or sidelined, kind of like what happened with you know American Online or CompuServe. Right. You know, they, right. they over time they just become you know less valuable. People are like why why do I need this account? I can just you know go and go on the regular internet, <laughs> right? You know, and it's also very difficult for any one company to create as much content as the rest of the world put together. With these worlds, you know, instead of having one theater, one you know one theme park, you know one whatever, which you know, most of these companies will just make one of everything, you'll have thousands of versions of all of these choices you could go to and people you can talk to, right? And and I think that the other thing is about the the, the, the population. Um, you have creators around the world, you have users around the world. This will become the new forum for people to talk to each other. And yeah. you know, I, I know you spend a lot of time trying to get the Western audience to understand the, the, the Chinese culture and the Chinese people. In this right. case, yeah. you know, instead of just you talking about it, you can say, hey, let's just come come with me. We'll go visit virtual Hangzhou or virtual Beijing. And nice. in there, there might be a million people in there and you just walk on that virtual street and, and let's let's talk to these people let's see what they care wow. about that kind of interaction will will allow people to remove a lot of the borders that used to separate us you know and and now, especially now with travel restrictions it's even harder to travel physically That's right absolutely yeah. But if you can travel in a virtual world, talk to them live and, and see, you know, people face to face, they may be an avatar. It will probably be a facially tracked avatar that will mimic the exact movements of that person in real time. And you can see, get some of the, the nonverbal activities, the, the hand movement, the, the, the facial movements, and, and you'll feel connected with that person. And that, that connection will allow us to remove a, a lot of the, the un, you know, kind of unneeded conflicts or unneeded distrust that we have between people. That's one of the, the biggest value I think that will be created is essentially we'll be creating a, a borderless global you know, a planet that, right. that, you know, it's about the human, uh, it's about human connections. You know, I'm uh, born in China, but I am uh, come from Eurasian parents. I right. spent half my world, half my life in China, half my life in the US. You know, right. and I've worked in Arc in both places and I work right now for a Taiwanese company. So, right. you know, I, 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 I don't, you know, care about any one country or, or company or whatever winning. What I right. care about is, is really more peace, more uh, understanding, uh, yeah. leading yeah. to the ability for us to communicate better. And I can't remember who said it, but if somebody said, if you can communicate clearly, there would be no reason for any conflict. When you can talk to somebody face to face, you can communicate a lot more clear than you can, you know, through an email or through a tweet, you know, <laughs> where people just want to, you know, create trolls or create you know, hate or create conflict or disagree with you on purpose because yeah. that's what you know when when you're in an anonymous environment you, you know doing these things feel like it makes you feel good to bring right. somebody else down whereas if you're face to face somebody you, you very few people will act that way so having that in person the the by having your 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 body in, you know in uh, in embodied presence in in a 3d space you actually feel that connection that physical connection and i think that's then incredible. you actually treat each other much more fairly and, and much more as humans yeah that's fantastic alvin that um you know that really excites me because i i never really fully understood all of the you know the, the future possibilities you know that the metaverse could give us and as someone that spends his time you know obviously building a youtube channel and you know trying to foster a better relationship between 
uh, United States, which is my home country, and you know China, a country that I've spent a lot of time in. I mean that 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 was really uh, inspiring to me when you said, "Hey, let's jump in here and let's go to this this virtual world and let's interact and you know we can essentially be in you know like a, a digital or, or virtual you know Beijing and have a look at that and interact with the people there. That would be that would be quite amazing. It's going to be amazing to see this uh, this transformation. I'm I'm really uh, I'm excited for all the all the future and. Uh, especially, you know, if we see more of these countries coming together and, you know, we create this open, you know, borderless environment. And like you said, you know, we've done it before, you know, we've had the internet and now anybody with a browser and a connection can send an email and, you know, connect with any country or any person in the world. Uh, that's, that's really, that's really exciting. I'm really excited yeah, about the future. Alvin, I've uh, I've so enjoyed our, our chat this evening. It's been so educational. And I know a lot of my fans have, um, you know, have asked me for more information about the metaverse. I did make a metaverse video. Um, if you guys are interested, you can watch that one where I actually have some great uh, demos of the potential new, you know, the, the, what the future of the metaverse will look like. But I think Alvin's given us a great, you know, really just better explanation and just, I think, a lot of a lot of excitement for, you know, for the future. I mean, I'm, I'm very excited to see what's this going to look like 10, 15, 20 years from now, you know, what our worlds are going to look like. And I know I know China is going to play a here, very huge part in this and going to be a big positive influence for the world in this in this matter. I'm very confident in that. Oh, sounds good. I, I totally agree. And I, uh, I watched your video, by the way. Listen, you did a great job. <laughs> OK, thank you. So, yeah, so I'm I'm really glad you invited me. Thank you, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully this message was was helpful to some of your audience. Yeah, absolutely. Any time that we can get a, a true expert, someone that's been in the VR space for as long as you have, and you know the accomplishments that you've accomplished so far with HTC, you know, in China. So we just want to wish you continued success, and uh, look forward to keep following you. And I'm going to also put a link down, uh, you know, to uh, you know you know you on LinkedIn. So if people want to follow you on LinkedIn, they can go ahead and follow your account. I know that you spend a lot of your time. You know, traveling around the world, essentially just giving uh, informational talks and, and presentations about the metaverse and the future world that we live in. I know that's a very big part of your job. So I know people that are interested in this, you know, they'd probably be very interested to follow you. So we'll put that information down below and also links to that other video. So thank you so much for coming on and look forward to seeing everybody in another video soon. Thanks, Rice. I'll see All you right. again soon. Perfect. Everyone, I have some exciting news. With the success of this channel, I'm expanding my team to bring more value to all of my Patreon members. We have some big plans to provide you with more information and news about the US and China relations. This will include more exclusive interviews, extended version of my YouTube videos, live Q&A sessions, and much more. With your loyal support, we can really be able to provide you guys with some amazing information and news. So if you aren't a Patreon member, you'll miss out. Simply click the link below and sign up today. And I want to thank each and every one of you who watches my videos. All of this would not be possible without your amazing support.